Hello, Pod Smashers of the Internet, and welcome to another episode of Termite's Buzz, episode 25. I'm your host, Termite. I'm a weekly video game podcast running through the video games I am playing and the trophies I'm collecting, along with some video game industry news, and I try to follow up with a retro video game discussion. So I've got a pretty cool show planned for y'all on this 4th of July weekend. I hope that you are all safe and celebrating well. I hope you have some fun, some time off work. The uh, the weather feels like summer here in Virginia, finally, after a mild ramp up. Uh, lots of humidity and sun. We've had some crazy storms and rain, and we've had family coming over to visit. Sorry for the delayed launch of this episode. I generally try to get them out on midnights on Mondays, but this episode is going to be sometime in the midday of Monday. July 3rd is when it goes live, and that's because of... Lots of things going on with the community that I live in. We are having a huge 4th of July field day. So if you remember the field days of old when you were in school, we'll have 10 different stations, different activities. We're having uh, food, of which I am responsible for providing everyone, um, like sandwich, sandwich brown bags. Should be a whole fun day. That's going to kick off tomorrow. So between that and getting the house ready for hosting guests and then entertaining and having fun with folks, uh, it was my son's fourth birthday over the weekend as well. So lots going on over in the household. Just have to sometimes delay getting an episode out, even if it is only by half a day. I try not to miss ever. In fact, 80-Bit Pod Smash went on for over five years without missing, and I believe this will be the seventh year in September of shows running on this channel nonstop, consecutive in a row, despite vacations and work trips and holidays. I try not to miss. I want to keep the content flowing uh, regardless of what's going on. The nature of the show, given that it's like a new show and it's like what I'm playing, I can't really stack episodes ahead of time like we were able to do with 80-Bit Pod Smash when we were doing topics. Uh, We could always pull from a litany of topics and talk about them ad nauseum uh, because those were kind of timeless, whereas mine is definitely what am I doing now and what's happening now in the industry so I don't know if I can ever like spin off episodes in advance. Maybe I could do like an entire Termites Buzz that's a retro s- study, a deep dive, like something. Uh, and maybe I could get a couple of those in the bank and then I could never miss. You know, I just got to sit down and think. I'm not the creative person. Penguin was my creative wing. Uh, I just like to talk about video games and what I'm playing and kind of react to the things that are happening in the industry and keep you all informed and up to date. Uh, and so thank you for listening. And if you're wondering what 80-Bit Pod Smash is, you can go over to 80bitpodsmash.com, and that's where you'll find links to all of our past episodes, our social media outlets, as well as our... Um, there's three things here. There's a podcast, there's social media, and... Nope, I think that's it. Yeah, the RSS feed, I guess. That's the podcast. There's 200 some episodes of 80-Bit retro episodes you can go look at um, and listen to, look at, put them in your ear. I don't know what you want to do. Whatever. It don't matter. Off to this week. What am I up to? What what games am I playing? What trophies am I pursuing? Uh, so I'm still playing Final Fantasy 16. I actually haven't played it in three days. I'm jonesing. Uh, I've got past a couple of amazing story beats, and it's it's got its hooks in me that I'm dying to play still. It's very addicting. It keeps me rolling. Again, I'm playing on the easiest difficulty. I've got some of the auto-assist accessories on, so I'm not dealing with any dying or any super big difficulty spikes or anything. I'm just enjoying the story, enjoying the world, the lore. I'm doing every side quest as they come up. I'm following a collectibles guide to make sure I get all the things, all the little knickknacks tchotchkes there's like a thing for the main character's bedroom there's a trophy to collect all the stuff for it uh and i haven't really looked at the trophy list i've just looked at the guide and the guide says to play the game with this collectible guide and do the things on it so i was like all right i will play through the whole game with the collectible guide until i finish it there's a second playthrough on new game plus on the harder final fantasy difficulty so i'm not looking forward to that but when you skip all the cutscenes and rush through everything and not have to worry about any of the collectibles, side quests, or any of the like, that second playthrough should be pretty short. But it's a long game. I'm like 20 hours in, and according to the scrolling bar on the collectibles guide, I'm probably like a third of the way through the game. And I've heard it's 60 hour ish campaign, so I don't want it to end. It's absolutely amazing. I love everything. My jaw still drops at some of the visuals. Um, it hasn't aged on me, I haven't gotten bored at all. <clears throat> and the story continues to unwind and unfold. So it's a great game. I highly recommend it for the summer, especially because there's not really anything big coming until 
I guess September 6th is when Starfield comes out. So that'll be the next one. Uh, I also needed something. So Final Fantasy 16 is a mature rated game. There's like, you don't know when it's going to get violent or when the language gets ramped up. Uh, so I don't try to play Final Fantasy 16 with the kids around. So there are times when I can play video games with the children around. And I decided since my son is home from summer break, he just turned eight, uh, that I would let him play PlayStation with me. And we were been, we've been playing um, Shredder's Revenge, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. I The PS5 version was added to PlayStation Plus, one of the tiers. I don't know which one it was. And so I didn't have to pay anything for it. I don't have any of the trophies in it. So I fired it up and started playing with my son. And now I have almost got the platinum in it i have to do the grindy stuff which is the the story mode there's a story mode where you run through like all 16 levels and the main characters of the the game all have an individual level and you you have to level every turtle and every character up to max level uh and so that's grindy you just have to play a lot um especially with story mode because you have to do the challenges and you have to do the collectibles to boost how fast it takes to get experience and you have to finish that campaign mode with every character so you have to get the ending there um, it's wild. So I'm working on those just kind of on the side whenever I feel like playing Ninja Turtles with my son. Um, I'm not really playing anything else. Uh, I did start Xenoblade Chronicles on the Switch, but like that's, that was just one 20 minute blurb of free time I had with my Switch when the TV was occupied. So, uh, that's not really much to say anything other than it's the definitive edition. And I had forgotten that they changed I guess Monolith Soft, the developers, is that it? is that really right? That doesn't sound right. Xenoblade Chronicles developer. Uh, yeah, Monolith Soft. Okay, I was thinking of a developer that made Fear. Fear. Uh, developer. Who was that? Monolith. That's so I wasn't crazy. All right. I'll take that. Cool. Monolith Soft. Um, the definitive edition on the Switch of Xenoblade Chronicles 1, uh, it is a port of the Wii game, but also the graphics were refreshed entirely almost, and they look like these more cell shaded cartoony kind of characters than they did in the Wii version, which was more of the Final Fantasy X-esque color and palette and things. So I thought that was the only thing that was stood out to me. It was like, oh, this is much, much prettier, and the UI makes more sense. Everything looks feels better, so I... I will hope to enjoy it uh, once I am in the lull of summertime after all these big games. Because after I'm done with Final Fantasy 16, I got to go back and do the Hogwarts Legacy Platinum, and I got to get the Star Wars Jedi Survivor Platinum. Uh, and then I would like to put some more time into Diablo 4, especially when Season 1 comes out. I wouldn't mind rolling a new character for it. Um, Necromancer is the other class I wanted to play, and right now I'm playing a sorcerer. So uh, lots of things to do on the gaming front. I'm always overloaded, always backlogged, and I'm still working my way through Black Ops 1 on the PlayStation 3, which I'm, yeah, I haven't played in a while because I've been busy. My PlayStation 3 is hooked up in the basement, so I traditionally play it whenever I have like a half hour here or there between work tasks or between work meetings. When I have some downtime, I will fire it up, but I haven't been in the basement and free and available to do that because I've been busy. Um, life takes precedent over games because that's how responsible adults live sometimes. Okay. News. What's going on in the news this week? Uh, it's a weird week. Nothing big bombshells. The FTC Microsoft case is still going on. So I got some things from there, uh, some layoffs too. But the first tidbit of news that I'm going to quote is from a Game Informer article written by Wesley LeBlanc. The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom is already the second best-selling game of 2023. This was as of June 27th. So let's see. Where is the figure? Piscatella. In Circana's report says U.S. consumer spending on video game, hardware, software, and accessories totaled $4 billion last month, representing a 12% increase compared to May. However, year-to-date consumer spending so far compared to 2022 is flat, coming in at $21.8 billion. Spending on video game content software grew 9% last month compared to May 2022, reaching $3.6 billion, Piscatella reports. On the physical games market, software spending reached its highest May total last month since 2014. 
For hardware, consumers spent $427 million last month, the highest in hardware spending in a May month since 2008. Year-to-date hardware spending is 23% higher overall compared to 2022, coming in at $2.2 billion. Things are going up. More people are buying video games. That's awesome. Unsurprisingly, given how well Tears of the Kingdom sold last month, Nintendo Switch's hardware was the best-selling platform in unit and dollar sales last month. May 2023 was the Switch's best-selling May in its lifetime thus far, and it was also Nintendo's second-best May month for hardware spending, second behind May of 2020. However, Sony PlayStation 5 console leads the overall 2023 hardware market in terms of unit and dollar sales. So that's an interesting statistic buried in there. May 2023 was the Switch's best-selling May in its lifetime so far. And it was Nintendo's second-best May for hardware spending behind 2020 of May, which makes sense because May of 2020 was the pandemic. Uh, best, but... That's weird. That's I don't understand how to break that down. May 2023 was the Switch's best-selling May in its lifetime thus far. Okay, so you read that and you say, okay, May of 2023, Nintendo sold more Switches in the month of May since 2017 when it came out. But it's also Nintendo's second-best May month for hardware spending behind May 2020. So that means May 2020, that doesn't make any sense. Unless second behind PlayStation 5? That doesn't also... I have no idea. Uh, A lot of figures here. Where's the Zelda figure? That's what I wanted to talk about. Why isn't that not reported here? Um, I guess it's just... Okay, here's a look at top 10 selling games from May of 2023. Uh, And that's just the month of May. Uh, Tears of the Kingdom is number one. Hogwarts Legacy is number two. Star Wars Jedi Survivor is number three. Dead Island 2 coming in in fourth. And Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 in fifth. Uh, also, surprisingly enough, you'd still see Mario Kart 8 in number 8th place, which is wild. So that was top 5 and then 8. Uh, the rest are a bunch of stuff. Uh, here's a look at top 10 best-selling games of 2023 so far. So of the calendar year, 2023, the best-selling games. Number 1, Hogwarts Legacy. Number 2, Zelda Tears of the Kingdom. Number 3, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, the 2022 one. Um, number 4th, fourth, fourth place, Star Wars Jedi Survivor. 5th place, Resident Evil 4 Remake. Uh, MLB The Show, Dead Island 2, FIFA 23, Dead Space Remake, and Madden NFL 23 wrap up the top 10. Uh, So I told you about all that. Um, Good stuff. I mean, Zelda is kicking butt. Second best-selling game of the year. Next to Harry Potter. So, I mean, I know Harry Potter, the franchise, that IP is absolutely massive. It hits all markets beyond just video games. And so it makes sense that that's the the number one best-selling game of 2023 so far. Plus, it was multi-platform. It was on Xbox, PlayStation uh, I think the PS4 version is also out now, so it really does hit like way many, way more consoles, bigger market share than Zelda. But given the Zelda, the number here, I don't believe Nintendo shares their digital sales at all, which means, one, Zelda's in second place for the entire year, physical sales only, and two, it's a Nintendo Switch exclusive, not multi-platform. So if you add the digital sales, is it more than Hogwarts? We don't know because we don't know what those are. But also very, very impressive for uh, a hardware console. Uh, a, a, sorry, a release for a console in its seventh year of existence uh, at this point. So lots of craziness going on over there. Plus May 2023 being the highest selling month for Switch since its launch shows that it still has legs which is funny in all of these conversations about like the next Switch, which I have a news bit for today on this show. But when people are talking about Switch Pro and Switch 2 and all these other things, like Nintendo sees these numbers, it sees this performance, it sees like Mario Kart 8 and The Legend of Zelda Tears of the Kingdom are still on the top 10 best selling games of May 2023. And that's physical only. That doesn't include the. Millions and millions and millions of sales upon millions of sales of all of the things on the eShop because those numbers don't get reported. So Nintendo's killing it. They're making hand over fist cash. The move, Mario movie just did a billion dollars. You know, astronomically rich, performing maybe at its peak. I mean, Nintendo is at peak Nintendo right now. They're hitting on all cylinders. Uh, and then we just saw the Nintendo Direct just blow us out of the mind, out of blow us out of the water, out of our minds with uh, excitement for the new Mario and Mario RPG remake and 
and the Peach game come in, and Luigi's Mansion 2 remake, all on the Switch, all on this kind. And we hadn't even seen Metroid Prime 4 yet. Pikmin 4 is coming. I mean, Nintendo's just crushing. So go Nintendo, keep doing what you do. Speaking of the Switch 2 conversations and rumors, everything that comes out of anything ever, any breath of iota of air about something to do with what's next for hardware, everyone reports on, and rumor mill goes wild. This is not a rumor, though. This is a quote. Uh, So I'm going to read from GameSpot's article from Evan Campbell. Nintendo will keep the same account system on next console for ease of use, apparently. So the fact that this is even a headline shows... Nintendo is still behind and archaic in their online infrastructure and their account handling systems because how they did the transition from the Wii to the 3DS to the Wii U to the Switch was awful and multi-pronged, confusing. How do you get that through line? How do I know it's me all the way through? You had to link this Nintendo account ID to a Nintendo email, to a Nintendo account, to a Wii U console account. It was nightmarish yes i'm being a little hyperbolic there was not four different accounts but it was something along those lines the separate nintendo id which was different from your nintendo account which was different from your email account at least required three different ids and they all had to be linked and synced up and you can only have one console linked per nintendo id it was crazy and backwards and awful the switch was just iteratively better And still kind of confusing, uh, as I had to help multiple neighbors here and where I live as they acquired Switches to get themselves set up and understand how profiles and email addresses and Nintendo accounts all link together. uh, And it's nuts. So, here we go. GameSpot's article. Your Nintendo account is apparently here to stay. Unlike the transition from 3DS and Wii U to the Switch, the company reportedly plans to carry over the same user system to the next generation of hardware. Spotted by IGN, Twitter user Genki JPN translated an answer from Nintendo president Shintaru Farukawa as a shareholder meeting last week. As for the transition from Nintendo Switch to the next generation machine, we want to do as much as possible in order to smoothly transition our customers while utilizing the Nintendo account, end quote. Furukawa reportedly said. It's important to keep in mind that Nintendo will release an official translation of the question and answer session in the coming days. I don't think that's out yet. The Nintendo account system originated before the launch of Mitomo on smartphones and became a user account for Switch upon the system's launch in 2017. Previously, 3DS and Wii U featured a Nintendo Network ID system. See? I was right. Look at that. In general, Nintendo has kept quiet about a Switch successor, though it will aim to, quote, surprise and delight, according to Nintendo of America president Doug Bowser. One other key transition point for Switch owners will be seeing what sort of backward compatibility the next system supports. Of course, that matters way too much. The Switch has been around. So since this generation of consoles, the one beginning in 2013, since then to now, all of the mainstream consoles and PC have mostly been aligned as far as third-party releases are concerned. So there's all these Switch games that you can also get on PlayStation 4, PlayStation 5, Xbox, PC, all these games out there. This has never been the case. Prior to 2013, prior to the release of the Switch, you had a Wii U, which was bespoke. And you had a PlayStation 3, Xbox 360, and a PC. And now some games were pushed to PlayStation and Xbox and PC. And those games you could get digitally. Uh, But the Wii U, the poor Wii U, had little to no third-party support. And then the Wii was so underpowered that any sort of games ported to it were also very unique and very specialized for that hardware. Now we're in an era where... Games can be ported between all of the consoles ridiculously simply. Like, the Nintendo Switch is on the ARM architecture, which I think is similar to smartphones, and the PlayStation 4, 5, and Xbox, and PCs are all on the x86 architecture. So it's way simpler now to port games across all the different platforms. Meaning, and where is this going? Backwards compatibility. Remember, there was a huge hurdle between PS3 and PS4. It's still the bane of PlayStation's existence. Microsoft 360, or Xbox 360 to Series X. Yes, backwards compatibility was there, but it took Microsoft an astronomical amount of work to create a list of backwards compatible games from the 360, and even going back to the original Xbox. Each individual title had to be massaged and worked out, recompiled to work on a modern system. And they did a ton of work, and there's a huge list, which is great, because it's way better than what Sony's doing. But if you remember the backwards compatibility between PS4 and PS5, almost day one, the entire library. And same for the Xbox One and the Xbox Series consoles. Day one, 
Everything on Game Pass, everything works. It's all backwards compatible. It's all the same. If Nintendo doesn't follow suit, because the Nintendo Switch is the new chalk line, they did not carry forward anything from Wii or Wii U. They didn't even carry forward the virtual console releases to everyone's chagrin. Nintendo just ate it when it came to the criticism they received and how angry everyone was that they spent all this money on acquiring this massive digital library on the 3DS and the Wii U's and then not being able to port any of that stuff forward to the Switch. They never even made an effort. And now, you know, we have the subscription model Nintendo Switch online service that has those games, but all your game saves, nothing can be transferred. Like, it's completely new. Nintendo cannot do that this time. They did that once, and I feel like they needed to just to get away from the the failure that was the Wii U. So it was kind of, they were it was necessary. It was a necessary step to, like, pivot. Well, we're not seeing the Switch be a catastrophic failure, uh, so that's cool. And also, the expectations are different. All the other console platforms are all completely backwards compatible. So the Switch better be. And I'm really confident. I feel like it's going to be. I feel like that whatever system comes next, the Nintendo Switch 2, uh, is going to be fully backwards compatible with the existing system because they have this Nintendo Switch online service that we've all been paying monthly into. Unprecedented for Nintendo. Nintendo's never had a subscription service that you can pay and get access to games for. And so they're going to want to keep people in. They want That's the point, right? That's how subscription models work. They make money because you lock people in long term and they pay monthly or yearly. And you don't want to break that. So you don't want to have to interrupt that subscription service for your next console. That's just how business works. That's how subscription models work. And I feel like it's a no-brainer to assume that the next Switch will still continue the Nintendo Switch online service subscription and you'll still get access to all those console, virtual console games, the classic stuff. PlayStation, not PlayStation, uh, Nintendo, Super Nintendo, N64, Game Boy, Game Boy Advance, Sega Genesis, all that stuff. So that's probably a shoe in I'm assuming your eShop purchases will all port forward because the architectures of the consoles will stay the same. Because there's no reason to deviate now. We're already here. Why would we go away from PC, uh, the x86, or the ARM architectures that all play nice together? So the internal architectures are likely going to stay the same. We have these subscription services in place. So there's a lot of evidence out there to suggest that the next Switch is probably going to be fully backwards compatible. I would be really, really, really shocked and surprised if it wasn't. Uh, but just because for Nintendo's line of consoles, this is the first time that they've been in a situation where they're playing super nice with third party and they have an architecture that is easy to approach. Um, and they've been they've been changing their business tactics a little, you know, playing nice with folks, especially Microsoft and Minecraft and how Smash Bros worked out, getting all those guest characters in there from third-party stuff. Uh, you can just see the Nintendo's like a little bit more open to stuff when they haven't been in the past. So that's that. Uh, hopefully this information is kind of a no-brainer for me, but the fact that it was reported on is just indicative of Nintendo being three steps behind everyone else when it comes to their online stuff. So expect your Nintendo account to carry over, and I would not be surprised to see all the rest too. Next bit of information is kind of more stuff coming out of the FTC versus Microsoft trial, but it's another fun headline. Sony's PlayStation chief privately said Microsoft Activision deal wasn't about Xbox exclusives. This is coming from The Verge, written by Tom Warren. Um, so there's continuing to be more news coming out. If you want to see that whole, I had quoted last week an IGN website that has a huge list of all of the things coming out of the trial. Uh, but... This is what I wanted to highlight from it sounded pretty interesting to me because it involves PlayStation, not just the whole Microsoft thing. So I'm going to read this snippet from the article. We're only minutes into the FTC versus Microsoft hearing and we're already had a bombshell revelation. Sony's PlayStation chief, Jim Ryan, believed that Microsoft's proposed acquisition of Activision Blizzard wasn't about locking games as Xbox exclusives, according to a newly unsealed email. Microsoft Council revealed the exchange between Ryan and Chris Deering, the former CEO of Com- Sony Computer Entertainment, discussing the announcement of the deal last year. Quote, It is not an exclusivity play at all, said Ryan. They're thinking bigger than that, and they have the cash to make moves like this. I've spent a fair amount of time with both Phil Spencer and Bobby Kotick over the past day, and I'm pretty sure we will continue to see Call of Duty on PlayStation for many years to come. End quote. The surprise revelation runs counter to Sony's arguments against Microsoft Activision Blizzard deal and its filing with regulators. Sony has maintained it fears Microsoft could make Call of Duty exclusive to Xbox or even sabotage the PlayStation versions of the game. Ryan went on to say, quote, we have some good stuff cooking, quote, referring to Sony's 
Bungie's acquisition, which Sony announced just days after that email exchange. Quote, I'm not complacent, and I'd rather this hadn't happened, but we'll be okay. We'll be more than okay. Microsoft initially offered Call of Duty on PlayStation for three years under the current agreement between Activision and Sony Ends. Ryan called that offer, quote, inadequate on many levels. Microsoft eventually offered Sony a 10-year deal for Call of Duty on PlayStation, but the company has refused to sign this so far. Call of Duty competition fears were initially a big part of UK's competition and markets authority, that's the CMA, investigation before the regulator dropped the console concerns and ended up blocking the deal due to cloud market competition concerns. The European Commission also dismissed concerns about Call of Duty or Xbox exclusive games, but the FTC's case is largely focused on the potential harm of Microsoft turning Activision games into Xbox exclusives across console cloud gaming and multi-game subscriptions. Today, showed Sony has known all along will stand by our promise to keep games on its platform and make made clear its work to lobby against the deal is only to protect its dominant position in the market, says David Cuddy, general manager of public affairs at Microsoft, in a statement to The Verge. So there you go. That's the comment that Microsoft has made. Kind of a duh in this whole FTC versus Microsoft thing, uh, revealing that email does discredit uh, PlayStation's deal. Um a little bit here because Sony's revealing that Microsoft is playing nicely with them. Yikes. Uh, There was another tidbit from that about um, $800 million is how much Call of Duty makes. Call of Duty on PlayStation. And that was revealed. Yes, Sony accidentally reveals Call of Duty is worth $800 million in PlayStation alone. So that that was... So there's that article from back when the deal was... Uh, it was an article of reporting on an email exchange right when the Activision acquisition was announced. And then, of course, the context of that is um, now we have an internal document from Sony revealing a whole bunch of confidential information about its PlayStation brand. Uh, and Jim Ryan wrote a letter, and the letter, which was poorly redacted, it, re- it mentions how much Call of Duty was worth to PlayStation alone. Specifically, the widely popular first-person shooter franchise directly generated over $800 million. Uh, unbelievable. That's uh, the only thing the document revealed. There's also another revelation from this trial, is how much of two of PlayStation's first-party titles cost to make. And those two titles are Horizon Forbidden West and Last of Us Part 1. We traditionally don't know the budgets of these games. There's so much to unpack here. Horizon Forbidden West cost $212 million to make, and The Last of Us Part 2 had a budget of $220 million to make. So that's how much you pay out to make a AAA budget game. $200 million. I remember when Destiny 1 first was like being talked about released. Remember, that was a cross-generation game from PS3, Xbox 360 to the PS4, Xbox One. And that was over $200 million. Unheard of. Absolutely bonkers, crazy expensive, unbelievable. How in the world? And of course, they were under Activision at the time, and they made they, they had Call of Duty money. Uh, and so that was huge then. But now we have Horizon Forbidden West and Last of Us Part II. Uh, and both of them were over $200 million each. Uh, it's standing up companies, 200 to 300 people, like employees, right? And that's astronomically expensive. Like, movies don't cost that much money to make. Of course, they're only two hours long, and there's a lot of curation and you do all the things. Like, a video game is so much more, and it makes sense that it would cost a lot more. Uh, video games have the reasons for for that bloat. I mean, the art, the assets, the animations, the voice acting, all of the coding, the engine, uh, all of the marketing and PR, and you got to have HR departments. you got to have everything from distribution and printing discs and all the things. I mean, it makes sense. I understand why it's that expensive. But if Call of Duty alone can generate $800 million, that's how much they make. PlayStation doesn't make Call of Duty, meaning the only cost of Call of Duty to them is however much it costs to buy the access, right? It's like Sony saying, hey, Activision, we want Call of Duty on PlayStation what does it cost to get that to happen? There's a deal signed, ba-doong, ba-ding, ba-dam, and Sony's making $800 million. That's crazy. Absolutely bonkers amount of money. And I don't know if that's like in a year or or ever, but if Call of Duty has made $800 million in the United States alone, oh, it's in 2021. United States alone, 2021. Meaning more than $800 million because of global markets and be each year. And it, these big, giant, juggernaut games, Horizon Forbidden West, The Last of Us Part Two, you can make four of them 
from just having Call of Duty on your platform. And each of those are profitable. So you see the money-churning machine that is Sony keeping Call of Duty. It is way more valuable to them than they've been revealed. Like, unbelievable. More interestingly, according to Ryan, internal surveys at Sony Interactive Entertainment claim that almost half of U.S.-based PS5 users also own a Nintendo Switch, while less than 20% of PS5 owners in the same country also own an Xbox Series X or, or Series S. And The Verge pointed out apparently 1 million PlayStation players play nothing but Call of Duty games. So it's act- active, like, Call of Duty's huge, y'all. I understand the, the listeners to this on this show may think or scoff or roll their eyes at Call of Duty. You're just like, oh, okay, it's a military shooter. It's, it is so big. <laughs> and it makes so much money. All of these battle passes, the microtransactions, the game has legs for days, for years, a yearly franchise hit. It just prints money. And it is a big, big deal to PlayStation. And they're definitely hiding those cards. They are, they are playing poker, for real. And downplaying the importance. Oh, it's not about exclusivity. All this stuff that I just read, uh, that Call of Duty is extremely important to PlayStation. So of course they're going to have a big stake here, and I, I just this was crazy, crazy news coming. Out. I did not realize one, t- two bits, two bits of information came out of there. It was how much those games cost to make, two hundred million dollars, and then how much Call of Duty makes Sony. Just nuts. But here we are. Um, next, another piece of information coming out of the trial. Microsoft considered a Square Enix buyout. This comes by way of Eurogamer, written by Tom Phillips. Microsoft considered launching a bid to buy Final Fantasy maker Square Enix. Freshly uncovered court documents have revealed. The idea was floated among top Xbox brass back in 2019 before Square Enix sold its suite of Western studios and before Microsoft got entangled in the current attempted Activision Blizzard buyout. Documents showing Microsoft's interest in acquiring Square Enix surface today as the company continues to plead its case with the FTC. Dubbed as, quote, Project Phoenix, the idea for Microsoft to buy Square Enix was based around the lure of owning the publisher's three main franchises for Final Fantasy, Dragon Quest, and Kingdom Hearts to gain a bigger Xbox audience in Japan and a publisher which released games on mobile. As with its subsequent acquisition of Elder Scrolls publisher Bethesda, Microsoft planned to continue releasing Square Enix's then-announced games across all relevant platforms with all future Square Enix releases, also launched into Game Pass on a day-and-date basis. Future Square Enix games would also, quote, preference Project Scarlet. That was the code name for Xbox Series X. Uh, And doing it would cannibalize, uh, Microsoft wrote, referencing the development code name, Microsoft accepted that doing so would cannibalize some sales. Details of Microsoft's buyout attempt are interesting, but perhaps not too surprising considering the news earlier this week that Microsoft had previously also mulled purchases of Sega and Destiny developer Bungie. Indeed, a merger review watch list from 2021 highlighted potential candidates such as Hitman Studio IO Interactive, Pokemon Go, Maker Niantic, Hades developer Supergiant Games, and more. In the years since 2019, Square Enix has, if anything, cozied up closer to PlayStation, with console exclusives such as the recently launched Final Fantasy XVI and the upcoming PlayStation exclusive Foam Stars. Back in 2019, Xbox Game Studios boss Matt Booty and Microsoft should, quote, spend Sony out of business, end quote, in another document revealed this week. Microsoft history with acquiring studios is in the spotlight this week as the FTC considers the impact of Xbox owning Call of Duty maker Activision. So yet again, another piece of information coming out of the trial. Lots of crazy stuff. Microsoft has been on this acquisition trend for a very long time and trying to just outspend the competition, buy all the stuff up. Like That was definitely the plan for having Bethesda and owning the Western RPG market uh, outside of CD Projekt Red, Bethesda is pretty much it. Uh, CD Projekt Red made The Witcher, right? So, but Fallout and Square and Elder Scrolls were huge, are huge Western RPGs. Uh, they were the that was the entrance of Western RPG. The whole open world, dialogue choices, crafting, all the things that you would see in Western RPGs versus the the Japanese ones, um, and they're very differently paced. Uh, very slow and huge and big. Yeah, I mean, I know I'm, what I'm saying is Japanese RPGs also have these th- things as well, but stuff like turn-based combat was not in Western RPGs. It was very action. One is a first-person... They're, they're all, like, first-person shooters, and, you know, you do 
different types of combinations of abilities and all the things, whereas Japanese RPGs were very menu text-based and had a lot more rigidity and structure, and some were linear, some were more open zone. Uh, they're very different. I mean, that's uh, we have a whole topic on 80-bit Pod Smash's feed about Western RPGs versus Japanese RPGs. You can go check that out. It was a great topic, great discussion we had. So that was obviously Microsoft's strategy was to acquire the best developer of Western RPGs and kind of make a tentpole in that. So their strategy to buy Square Enix would have also been sound it had it worked uh, to also have the tentpole of Japanese RPGs and the, the biggest Japanese RPG maker out there, publisher, um, is them. So, yeah, to have that under, to have Final Fantasy and Kingdom Hearts and I don't even remember the other franchises all under... Uh, I mean, at the time, Crystal Dynamics and IO Interactive were probably with Square. IO Interactive broke away from Square, um, so having that as an acquisition makes sense, a uh, strategy. But I'm glad that didn't happen. Too much consolidation, too many things under... Like, Microsoft needs to pump the brakes. I'm really, really glad that they're getting a lot of resistance to this Blizzard Activision uh, acquisition thing, and I hope that if it does go through, there's a lot of caveats to play nice with all the other platforms. Uh, I hope that someone is... Well, I'm glad that there's the FTC and the CMA. And then these folks, these organizations are watching and trying to protect the markets from Microsoft outspending everyone. So uh, that's interesting. Uh, and that is it for the news this week. Um, Pokemon Go developer Niantic laid off another 230 employees. They shut down an office, I think, in L.A., uh, and so they're conti- and they canceled. There was a Marvel game coming from them. They just shut that whole development down uh, and downsizing. So the bubble on the Pokemon Go has popped. I'm sure it was uh, revitalized during the pandemic, the lockdowns encouraging everyone to be outside and move. But uh, since then, now it's kind of dwindling, and interest is d- d- the bubble popped. You know, it's like here's all this major popular thing and only can last so long. Can you sustain it? So sad to see 230 employees laid off. I hope they can all find themselves on their feet again with the experience that they have there. Hope there's good severance packages. I don't, I don't really know how they're treated, but that's the risk of the video game industry is the, it's so volatile with the studios coming up, going down funding and all this stuff happening. Um, it's a very, very difficult industry to stay in to make a living. So as far as, uh, news that's done and retro discussion talk so as i was playing final fantasy 16 i had this moment of like reflecting on all of my history with final fantasy uh, my whole life um of course starting with super mario super mario rpg which is really the birth of my final fantasy fandom uh going through final fantasy 7 being my first like real final fantasy to chew on and then final fantasy tactics final fantasy 9 final fantasy 10 um, and through uh, 12 and how I dabbled, but there's certain like obvious tropes for Final Fantasy or like Chocobos and the Moogles uh, and the music. Uh, those are obvious like, okay, I'm in a Final Fantasy world, but there's more to the Final Fantasy DNA. And in that is it's hard to tease out, but it's how the music is presented uh, when you're running around a city. And I felt like there are these little like villages and, these little kind of like clusters of buildings that you go to in Final Fantasy 16 that are so reminiscent of the tiny little towns that you go to in Final Fantasy 1, Final Fantasy 3, and those old, even like 6. Um, and the town music always stood out to me in those old Final Fantasy games. And it's really, really cool to hear similar type that, that vibe, it's more of like a vibe. It's the combination, it's the sum of its parts that make it feel very Final Fantasy. And of course, it has the the medieval like tone or like art style and and all that makes makes it very reminiscent of the old Final Fantasies fully realized. Like I almost feel like you could take Final Fantasy sixteen and demaster it down to like a top down sixteen or eight bit pixel art and it would be gorgeous with the same music and the same map layout it would be awesome and wouldn't lose anything remove all the voice acting and just have like the pixel font like that'd be awesome uh and it would still be super super valuable but it, that's the through line that's the dna that i've been experiencing with final fantasy and it made me reflect on like my history with final fantasy franchise all the way up through like the playstation one era which is when i started that's when we were starting to get like more high quality audio and like orchestrated uh, music, and then we had the, of course the the CGI like um, 
cutscenes that would come in. We used to call them cinemas. You know, like every time there was a cinema, everyone be quiet. We have to watch this thing. This is awesome. Super high quality graphics, and you get to really see what's happening. And of course, now like Final Fantasy 16 looks like. Final Fantasy not way better than even than the original PlayStation One's cinematic graphics, and Final Fantasy Seven had that awesome new way of doing full motion video and the pixel art all on one screen at one time. How cool that was! Uh, and now we're just so far advanced ahead of time, but it's really really cool. What so I was reflecting on my love for Final Fantasy uh, with all the music and the feel. So even into the, like the dungeons, I was running through a cave in Final Fantasy 16. And of course, it's kind of linear, and there's like a fork, and you can take either path, and they both end up in the same spot. Uh, and I was musing on Discord with um, Jimothy and T-Bone and friends, uh, and Jimothy pointed out um, how there needs to be less linearity. Like the older Final Fantasies had deeper dungeons and kind of puzzles to solve and way more branching paths but also more dead ends and so and you would get stuck like fighting more enemies because of the random encounters so that was the cost to pay out uh you know you'd spend more time exploring but you'd also put your party at risk because you're using resources to stay alive to stay healed whether that resource is mp which ultimately you need ethers and elixirs to heal uh or you know because that's your hp or if there's any i don't, I don't think there's durability in final fantasy games but uh for your equipment but you have an item storage right so you're using items using potions ethers elixirs to keep your party up to date so you would have to spend kind of resources for that that risk payout uh ratio it's like what kind of weapon am i going to find on this corner of the cave or if or not uh, and then you gain experience by fighting the monsters, so you're slightly stronger until you approach the boss. But the bosses are another thing in Final Fantasy 16 that also that harken back to older Final Fantasies, where you would go through a cave and you would fight many bosses. Like I feel like the the sub bosses and the bosses in Final Fantasy 16 have the same kind of rhythm that the old school Final Fantasies have, uh, and the style of the art of the monsters, what they look like, how they act. And that's where that's where you draw from Final Fantasy fourteen and maybe even from twelve is how the enemy's attack patterns work now that you can control Clive in sixteen completely by moving the joystick, right? It's not a stagnant your party's on the left and your monsters are on the right, or vice versa. And you know, it's not the the monsters can actually do things, area of effect damage, like they can do straight line attacks and there's different warning signs about like what attack is about to happen they launch things into the air and fall down around you and blow up and there's always markings on the ground places you have to dodge stuff you can't stand in because it'll hurt you so you got to move out of the way so you're constantly like dance fighting it's it's almost like that whole raid the monster's doing this and the whole party needs to work together to move out of the way uh and learning the monster's tactics strategies and all you know, learning the patterns and so I think that harkens back to Final Fantasy XI, Final Fantasy XII, and Final Fantasy XIV, which all of those felt, you know, those are the MMOs except for XII, which was not an MMO, but, like, had that kind of vibe. And I feel like that's... Final Fantasy VII Remake, of course, had that with its bosses. But the bosses in Final Fantasy VII were way... I feel like way bigger and way more serious. And Final Fantasy XVI has those, those tentpole bosses, but there's a lot more sub-bosses. So you're doing that whole thing more often, more frequently, but this, it doesn't seem as serious or like the stakes aren't that high. And that could just be because I'm playing on an easy with some of the auto auto combo stuff going on, so I don't feel it. But uh, I'm just loving comparing and contrasting and the vibe and the feel of Final Fantasy XVI versus the old ones and how... Even the story, the political intrigue, you know, harkens back to tactics a little bit. It harkens back to Final Fantasy IX, you know, different nations that were at war with each other and where the characters are in the middle of that and how it affects their their journey through the game, uh, character arcs. And so, um, yeah, I'm just loving it. I'm obsessed. So kind of my, my retro talk is just about the old Final Fantasies. And I really want to get that Pixel Master collection that has Final Fantasies one through six. And I want to follow guides to get those done, knock them out, get a bunch of platinums, and enjoy old school Final Fantasy. I purposely didn't because it's seventy five dollars for the bundle, which is a little steep. And I also didn't have time to even start them between all of these big releases that have happened. And so once I circle back around and get more time to play the backlog and clear myself up a little bit, 
by then it'll be fall and I'll be buried in Starfield, Forza Motorsport, and Spider-Man 2. So who knows what's going to happen, when it'll happen. But maybe I can get some Pixel Remaster in, maybe in the winter. You know, because October I want to go back and try to play new stuff I haven't played yet, like Dead Space Remake, Final, uh, Resident Evil 4 Remake. Uh, and I want to play, maybe I'll play Callisto Protocol, but that's really low on the priority list. So, um... Those are my October, like, Halloween games, right? It's fall, it's scary, it's spooky. Gotta play some stuff like Resident Evil. And, um... Yeah, re- that's that's it. That's the retro talk. I love Final Fantasy. My single favorite Final Fantasy, of course, is 7. Um, and whether Remake will dethrone it, I don't know. It has yet to be determined. Because the first Remake was amazing. But it was only a small tidbit of the whole story. And I want to see more about what they have done as far as their new changes and new direction... The Crisis Core remake was awesome, and I'm so glad that that exists. And if you haven't played Crisis Core, I highly recommend you do that before Remake 2 comes out, because it does tie in an entire different character and where they end up at the end of Final Fantasy VII Remake and at the beginning of the second part. Uh, It matters as far as story is concerned, so I highly recommend Crisis Core uh, if you haven't. Um, despite all of its how dated it feels, it's a PSP game ported to modern consoles with a fresh paint coat of paint. It's still worth it. It's still awesome. It's still Final Fantasy. I love it. With that, uh, I think I will see you next week. Hope to find you uh, coming back, listening to more. I don't know what I'll be moved on to. Maybe I'll have a platinum trophy. Maybe I'll have finished Final Fantasy 16 story. I don't know. It's a crazy week. It's summertime. Hope you all enjoy your summer. See you next week. <laughs>